Hello and welcome to South Carolina's episode of Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. As we enter the official beginning of spring and St. Patrick's Day, we're reminded of the legend of St. Patrick, who's said to have driven the snakes out of Ireland. Well, farmers do something similar as they drive the pests out of their fields. They also turn greens into green. We'll have that story and more coming up as we tell you about our shoe fly pie, our farmer outstanding in the field, and our palmetto portraits. All that and more coming up in just a moment. This time of year, South Carolina farmers seem to have something in common with the legend of St. Patrick. As the legend goes, he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Of course, some researchers say snakes never inhabited the island in the first place. Instead of snakes, farmers spend a lot of time, effort, and attention controlling a variety of other pests in the field, like beetles, flies, and caterpillars. Jeff Zender, a professor at Clemson University, one of South Carolina's land-grant institutions, coordinates the university's integrated pest management and sustainable agriculture programs. You know, what we do is, and I think you know, many of the Clemson Ag programs do, is they're, they're in constant communication with their stakeholders, with the farmers, you know, with NGO organizations, you know, finding out, you know, what are the needs, you know, what are the needs around the state. Like for example, our program, we have a, a, an advisory committee made up of representatives from, you know, the farming community, the extension community, you know, industry. You know, we get together and we, we discuss issues, we prioritize issues, and then given the budget that we have, we, we do our programs. And I think that's how a lot of the programs at Clemson work. And, you know, people are, are so, you know, interested and um, sort of in need of, you know, educational programs like, you know, for example, you know, we get calls all the time from people that say, you know, I've got some land and I want to start farming. How do I begin? So that's where we can kind of step in and, you know, maybe point them in the right direction. A lot has changed over the past couple of decades. Farmers have transitioned from an era of treating their fields and pests based on the calendar, where they would spray large quantities of crop protection products at certain times of the year, to a time when they don't use any pest products on their crops if there's no need to do so. You know, rather than using just say one tactic like pesticides, an example, you would integrate all possible uh, methods to control pests. Um, and the advantage of that is if you're, you know, obviously if you're using pesticides repeatedly, the pests are going to develop resistance. So, you know, they advocated using um, other practices like uh, planting resistant varieties that are resistant to pests. So you don't have to rely on the pesticides. Using cultural practices to, to make your farm situation less attractive to pests. Using biological control methods. So it, it was an integration of, of all of these and that's the IPM concept. And, and it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a challenge to, uh, you know, for your particular situation in farm to come up with uh, uh, a set of practices with all these different methods that's most appropriate for your farm and that will work for you. But, so that's what we try to do to help farmers and extension agents that are training other farmers um, sort of get a, get a handle on how to put that all together. Lexington County, South Carolina farmer Chris Rawl vice president of Clayton Rawl Farms, is like most farmers who care primarily about protecting the health, safety, and well-being of his consumers. As a businessman, Chris also cares about protecting the bottom line of his operation, which means he's not going to spend money on treatments his produce doesn't need, like pesticides. 
we use crop protection products on a prescriptive type manner. We do not just uh, use them uh, because it's, it, the calendar says it's time to put it out. We use them based off of uh, field scouting and reports that you know that come back and we make a, a decision of, of when to apply. So, I mean, you just do not put anything Yeah, oh out my there. gosh, they're very, they're very expensive. Um, a, a, the average person does not have a clue what, how, what it costs to, to produce these crops and that is one of our major expenses uh, in producing a crop or the, uh, the crop protection products. Entomologist and Clemson Extension Service Associate Powell Smith works with farmers like Chris Rawl and others around the state to help them find the best, most economical means to protect their crops from pests and other predators. He says farmers have moved from a time when they used to apply pounds of products per acre to now when they use ounces per acre at a time when they've seen their acreage and yields increase. This is typical caterpillar feeding here. Yeah, it's fairly recent. We can actually probably possibly find an insect on here. But this is, this is, these insects co-evolved with brassica, so they, they tolerate the same weather conditions that their host plant does. Yeah, that one's, that one's gone, but you can see there, there's, there's damage out here. One plant out of all these many has damage. When Dr. Smith works with farmers to design integrated pest management programs, he encourages them to practice conservation and enhancement measures. Conservation being that we know there's natural enemies in the field feeding on the pest, so we choose our pesticides carefully so that we don't kill those uh, outright and uh, also by using a threshold and determining what population levels of insects are sub-economic. In other words, a real simple way to put it, if an insect's causing you $2 an acre damage and it costs you $5 an acre to spray for it, then you're losing $3 an acre by spraying at that level. So what we've done is used research to determine what population levels in certain crops would be economically damaging and we withhold treatment until we approach or reach that point. And that minimizes exposure to these pesticides, reducing residue on the crop and non-target effects. Now, the second stage of that would be enhancement and we're using uh, field border vegetation both natural and planted that blooms to provide nectar and pollen for these adult uh, predators to feed. Many times their larvae are what feeds on the pest whereas the adults have a whole different food supply so rather than scalping and mowing all the field borders and manicuring them like a golf course, we've allowed them to grow up in cases where we're not going to suffer disease and other pests. But a lot of our blooming vegetation actually supports a, a pretty good host of natural enemies. Then the third step beyond that would be is if we see a situation where we're not getting adequate control through conservation and enhancement, we can purchase selected natural enemies that are specific for various pests in the field and we can release those and, and we've done that here with two little small parasitic wasps that we purchased from an insectary that, that grows the insects and, and offers them for sale and we can see some measurable success. It's a little bit tedious for the growers mm -hmm. but they uh, have adapted well to, or, uh, you know, to you know, a new pest management approach compared to the old calendar spray approach which was popular you know, 20 years ago. South Carolina is a leading producer of brassicas, formerly known as crucifer vegetables. Brassicas are the nutritional powerhouse of vegetables whose stems, flowers, roots, and leaves can be cooked and eaten. That's primarily what you'll see growing around South Carolina in late winter months. And while brassicas used to be considered just cold weather crops, researchers have found varieties that can grow year round. The ranges from cabbage to collards, uh, turnip, mustard greens, uh, kale, and so on. Uh, they are, they are, they'll take temperatures below 32 degrees where other crops like squash, beans, corn, and those things won't take uh, temperatures below 32 degrees. As far as taking the cold, again, they can also take some of the, uh, the heat as well. So we, we can grow them in the summertime, you know, as long as it stays below 90 degrees. When it starts getting above 90 degrees, we, we have a little trouble. When and where they can, farmers grow their crops under blankets to raise the ambient temperature and protect the leafy greens from harsh winter elements. What he's trying to do is accelerate this crop. Turnips will tolerate the weather pretty well, but what he's doing is raising the ambient temperature underneath that cover to get a little bit uh, faster growth. You can see the, the difference in, in growth on these turnips compared to the ones out from under the cover. 
Whether the farmer is using the most innovative pest protection methods possible or using crop covers, one thing's for sure, it's all in an effort to produce the safest, most efficient, effective crop possible so the consumer will be happy. Well, the secret to produce is to be able to produce it the way your customer wants it. So a lot of these farms will put up the same. I mean, they probably pack collards 20 different ways on these farms here, you know. Different size bunches, different number of bunches per bag, loose leaf, all kinds of different ways. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll go to Blackville, South Carolina and visit Miller's Bread Basket for a little shoe fly pie. Welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Voices of Agriculture. Today we're in the small town of Blackville, South Carolina in Barnwell County to introduce you to Miller's Bread Basket Restaurant, Bakery and Gift Shop. A tourist destination for nearly 25 years, Miller's offers what owner Ray Miller calls Pennsylvania Dutch with a Southern touch. The, the restaurant, open Monday through Saturday, offers tasty Southern cooking on an a la carte buffet for lunch and for dinner on Thursday and Friday nights. With a Mennonite background, Ray says it was important to establish a family-friendly business. Well, we have lived up north, and uh, we're actually Susie from Ohio, and I'm from Indiana. Married, lived up there four years, and I've always kind of wanted to do something with my family, of course. And so the Lord blessed us with a family of six daughters and two sons. And uh, after the first two were kind of away from home already on their own, the youngest one in school, I said, Susie, this is the time to do the restaurant. And she agreed. So we found this little empty building here in Blackville and started from scratch and just kind of did it to just plain plain Jane family restaurant and it's been good to us and especially since the children could work in here so the daughters worked in here and sometimes the son the youngest son and it's been been good it's been fun so we think about family restaurants sometimes yeah. you think about people bringing their families but you, okay. you've you've had the uh, uh, similar situation but from the other side you've had your family work actually we have both you know we have the family working here and Susie's been the, the coordinator of the staff and also of the kitchen and I've been kind of the PR person out in the restaurant and so we've been here 23 years and the children grew up in here like we said and and uh, it's been good to us Got a little gift shop that we use for credit card uh, swipes and also for the bread sales mm -hmm. we've had people from every state in the Union and um, including Hawaii and Alaska, of course, and a lot of international people, too. Got an interesting guest book there. We've had people, we have Good Morning America stop here, and Tiger Woods stopped here at least once. Yeah, how about and so, uh, yeah, we, we enjoy seeing where people are from, and, and they sign our guest books. We kind of specialize in uh, the frosting breads and the regular breads. And then we, of course, do our homemade pies. And shoe fly pie is one of those. Then we do pecan and German chocolate, and we do cheesecakes, and we also do uh, uh, lemon meringue and coconut cream. Coconut cream has probably been our best seller, but shoe fly pie, some people have heard the song, but never had shoe fly pie, so they're interested in tasting it. We do serve a uh, good line of just plain, simple vegetables, cabbage and Harvard beets, and lima beans and carrots and green beans, and. Stewed tomatoes has kind of a, become one of our specialties here. And then we'd have um, uh, mashed potatoes and rice that are not out yet, but they'll be here before 11. And today we have meatloaf on the menu almost every day. And then we've got chicken and dressing and chicken noodles and some chicken livers. It's kind of a chicken day today. 
and the fried chicken is in the fryer ready to come out here in just a minute. So we'll be ready in about 15 minutes to serve. Since we talked about pest management earlier in the program, we thought we'd go into Miller's kitchen to watch them make their famous shoe fly pie. I'm Will Stolswitz. I'm from Miller's Bread Basket, and we're going to be making some um, shoe fly pie today. I start out by putting king syrup in my bowl. This has been put in the oven, just a warm oven, so that it runs out good. And learning this recipe from an older person in our church. We're frugal, so we pour the water that we need into the bottles. It is warm water to help rinse it out. Then you add a teaspoon and a half of soda. A half a cup of brown sugar. You need to stir it up a little bit. Six eggs that have been beat with a fork. You don't want them all beaten up. Mix it all together. It's beginning to look good and yummy and caramely. After you have it all mixed together, this is what you'd consider the bottom layer of the pie. You add four handfuls of shoe fly crumbs, which is flour, brown sugar, shortening, and um, baking powder. You stir that in. It kind of gives the bottom layer of this pie some texture. We get our pie crust ready. You like to make sure your pie crust doesn't have a lot of cracks or holes in it because it is a um, fairly liquidy runny pie when it goes in. A little bit of those lumps don't matter. I try to get as most of them out as I can but Then we take some of these same shoe fly crumbs and spread them over the top to cover up this bottom layer. I usually like to put about three of them on. If I put more, it makes more of a dry bottom pie like, like some people up north especially do, but Mr. Ray prefers the the wet bottom and so we don't put as many crumbs on therefore it's not as dry the whole way through. And that's basically it. We put it in the oven. We bake it about 45 minutes but I watch it. You don't want it extra brown but yet you want it kind of set. You know those of you that bakes pies you can tell when the pie is set by how it jiggles or it doesn't. And this is our shoe fly pie as it's done baking, ready to come out of the oven. So hopefully people come in here and, and find a little peace in this troubled world. Yeah, yeah, soul food. Soul food. <laughs> Good deal, Ray, thanks so much. You bet.
Farmers Grade A Goat Dairy, which um, used to be totally unique. Um, there are a few, few more dairies, um, and of course it was a totally ridiculous business decision to try to make goat cheese in South Carolina as opposed to Wisconsin or New York or California. But I loved South Carolina, and I wanted to farm here. this we've um, tried to maintain the integrity of the herd and the bloodlines because that's what got me started. I love to breed the goats, love to show the goats. But this is not an agritourism, it's an ag education stop. You know if you're driving down the road um, and, and, and want a place to learn about the goats and to learn about farming, that's what we want to do. This is our almond apricot cheese ball, which again is another really successful um, cheese for us. Our chev logs, that's a pesto and a plain and a, and a pepper. We do our own soap. We, um, it's all natural. We don't use any petroleum products. As best anybody can document, goat was probably the first domesticated animal. And um, so I think that's pretty incredible. And I think as our connection with our food gets tighter and tighter, I think they'll have a, a, a bigger place maybe in agriculture. Well, that's all the time we have for South Carolina's episode of Voices of Agriculture. Thanks for watching. We hope you've learned about brassicas vegetables, integrated pest management, and the other stories we've shared with you in this episode. For more information on those and more that we've covered throughout the months, log on to our website, scfb.org. Until next time, I'm your host, Reggie Hall.